go we've had, what a treat, it's been extraordinary, and what responsibility educators in schools carry today. Um, and we're going to be focusing the, in the last part of, of the afternoon on practical things that we can take away with us. But before we do that, um, I couldn't miss this opportunity with, with having Rose here, um, and Rose hasn't had a chance to speak today, but I have been fortunate enough to read this book, which Simon has just mentioned, um, and um, I found it absolutely fascinating. It is full of practical advice for uh, us as educators to take back into our schools. Um, and Rose highlights uh, the limits of artificial intelligence and uh, encourages us to look really positively at all the things that only human intelligence can do and talks very persuasively about the blend that we need to get right between human and artificial intelligence. Um, but I thought, Rose, we might just ask you to, to take a few minutes at the beginning to tell us a little bit about not so much the seven intelligences you discuss, but the perceived uh, self-efficacy that you talk about is the most important of all. So can I hand over yes. to you? Sure. Thank, Thank you very much indeed. indeed. And I'm really pleased that you found the book useful because I wrote it for educators because I really want educators to understand much more about artificial intelligence. And the basic premise is that because we do now have very smart AI algorithms combined with data, and as Stephen has eloquently um, told you, um, masses of data, affordable processing power and memory in our technology, we can now do amazing things using AI. And I think that precipitates the need for us to re-evaluate our own human intelligence and to think about the ways in which humans are different. And I would expand a little more on what Stephen has said. I completely agree, social intelligence, fundamentally important to humans. But in the book, I outline an interwoven model of intelligence that's thinking about the whole person, including their physical experience in the world and their contextual intelligence, um, and suggests there are seven elements to this interwoven intelligence. And one of them is the academic intelligence that we know our AI systems are incredibly good at. Um, the engine driving, as, as you were putting it, Simon. But I would say that that now needs to be far more interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary because complex problems require solutions from multiple disciplines. And then social intelligence. But then I talk about what I describe as meta-intelligence. And this is the ability to know ourselves. And that's what perceived self-efficacy is really all about. And it's what I was just talking to Stephen about. I think we have not done enough to develop our own understanding of ourselves. This is the area where we could excel and we could stay ahead of the algorithms, but we don't do enough to foster it. So it is about personal epistemologies. It's a horrible word, I know, but it's really important. Where does knowledge come from? How do I know this is true? Where's the evidence? How can I justify that actually I should believe this? Um, it, it's about subjective intelligence, understanding our own emotional state, but also the emotional state of others, because then there's the social intelligence that's all important, and that has a meta aspect as well, so that we can work out how we interact with other people appropriately. The meta contextual intelligence, we're really good at changing contexts and understanding how to behave. We're good at that. We may not always get it optimally right, but we are good at that. Um, and our physical presence is so important, and I think we often underestimate that. It's, it's very connected to our emotions and that feeling, that all-important feeling of accurate perceived self-efficacy. The evidence-based knowledge about what we do know and what we don't know that's accurate. The evidence-based assessment of goals. Can we achieve this goal? Can't we achieve this goal? Do we think we can learn enough to achieve this goal? Are we going to? Are we motivated enough? And if we're not motivated enough, why are we not motivated enough? So it's all this knowing thyself. As Harari points out in his most recent book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, when he spends the final chapters 
really talking about meditation and getting a deep insight to yourself. From an educational point of view, that's what accurate perceived self-efficacy is all about. It's an evidence-based judgment about what we know, how we feel, whether we formed a goal and whether we can achieve that goal. And whilst we're capable of doing this, we're not actually naturally very good at it. We often don't know what we know. The more information we are given, the more we believe we know, but often actually we know less. So we're not saying we're naturally good at these things, but we can learn them. And that's what's so important. Your point, Stephen, about learning how to learn. For the future, that's going to be the most important thing, and learning how to be resilient in the face of failure, because failure is what helps us to learn. So that's really where that accurate perceived self-efficacy comes in. It's the culmination of that interwoven intelligence. There's seven different elements. I hope that helps to explain it. Thank you very much for that, Rose. That's uh, hugely helpful. Um, I'm just going to ask Rose one more question, again, because we didn't have the benefit of hearing her talk. And that is, in your book, you touch on the particular skills that people who are um, tasked with or choose to develop AI now should, should have. What kind of people should be developing our artificial intelligence? Can you comment on that? Absolutely. Um... Whenever I go to events to talk about artificial intelligence, I find I'm a bit of a minority. And that's just based on gender. And if we think culturally, there's even more of a... So we need to embrace diversity. And we need people who understand the importance of diversity and how to embrace that diversity in the way that we develop our systems. And I actually think everybody needs to understand the kind of thing that Stephen was talking about. What is artificial intelligence? Why is data so important to machine learning? What is artificial intelligence capable of doing and what is it not capable of doing? What should we allow it to do and what should we not allow it to do? And I think the most important component for anybody involved in developing AI is ethics. You know, a sound grounding in ethical reasoning and ethical understanding, you know, it's really important that we get that in the DNA of everybody who's involved in developing AI systems. But personally, from an educational point of view, I think the best way that we could move ahead in terms of thinking about how AI should impact on education and can be used in education is co-design between educators and AI developers. Because that will help educators to understand more about what AI is. It will help AI developers, most of whom do not understand anything about teaching and learning. I'm talking about people who develop AI for use in education. Um, and therefore, you get that cross-learning, and then you get better AI technologies at the end of it as well. Thank you very much. Well, um, there's lots to explore in, in what Rose has just told us. But before I open it to the floor, I'm actually going to ask each of the panel <clears throat> to comment on what they would be doing now if they were running a school. You know, what, what should we all be taking back as school leaders? What, would, what should we be doing? I know one of you is running a school. But for, for the rest of you, um, what, what, what are the most important things for us to take back now? And please remember that in this room, there are people who, with responsibility for children the whole way through, you know, from, from 3 to 18. Uh, so can I ask, start, Stephen, with you. Now I really do feel like an imposter. <laughs> <laughs> Having um, had the pleasure of watching children of my own go through the educational system, and having obviously been through it myself, I think it's about the, the need for children to explore the successes or failures, to have an education that isn't entirely goal-based, and I know that's extraordinarily difficult in this country in particular, but actually we really don't learn very much of the joy of learning. <laughs> so learning the joy of learning, how you achieve that is is very difficult because I know as a balance you do have to meet goals, there are targets, sometimes imposed within, sometimes imposed by parental expectations and other times by, by government. Um, 
um, <coughs> somehow we need to find a way for children to explore. Uh, I was talking to those having spent time in Scandinavia, I'm always shocked at how exploration by play, learning how to learn, is driven very much in a child-centric way. Uh, there are no tests, there's nothing formal, even in sports. Um, you know, I'm a tennis player and part-time professor, and uh, you know, I was, you know, I was learnt, I learned a sport by the bitterness of failure, and you know, people are going, oh, you lost, no, I'll get better. Coaching like that, that's not done in other countries. Schools not kept. I think people begin to enjoy the path of improvement. If we can do that, we create a population of individuals who can turn that joy of learning to whatever their talents require. They don't need to be the best. Best book I think I've ever given was called Good Enough Parenting. Yeah? You can't be the best, you can't be the best dad in the world, despite I have socks that say I am, so I'm not <laughs> Yeah, it is the best dad in the world. So I, you know, I can only be second best. But truly, it's about just not being bad. And we need somehow for children to not feel that they can't fail. So. Thank you. John. If I can draw three threads together here, metacognition, the idea of intelligence, IQ, and failure. There's a wonderful researcher at Stanford, you've probably heard of, named Carol Dweck. And Carol Dweck is all about how people, children, uh, everybody, has their own personal theory of intelligence. And she breaks it down into two types. One is a fixed or static view of intelligence. The other is a fluid version. And for the fluid version, she has this now in classrooms. And one of my daughters, I think when she was 10, teachers had some of Carol Dweck's stuff on the wall. The failure is an opportunity. In fact, they, when they fail on a test in that classroom, when they, they do badly, they're actually happy about it. They're actually happy because it's an opportunity for them to learn more. And they have this opportunity where the other kids don't. And they're going to get to learn more. And it, it, it really matters what the child's theory is of intelligence, where it's something that can grow and be bigger, or if it's something static as to how they interpret their failure experiences and how they even interpret their success experiences. And it's study after study after study, what they, what they show is the children that have this fluid idea of growth and intelligence react to failure in a positive way to learn more. And you can actually train kids and, and, and teachers in elementary schools and young children have actually used this to actually get that idea across and change the child's view of intelligence. So this is a metacognitive view of, of how my own intelligence works, grows or doesn't. But so many kids have this static, fixed view and so they face failures that this just reflects how dumb I am. Uh, I'm not going to get any better, I can't do this, and they give up. Versus this is an opportunity for growth, and it really makes a difference. Uh, I should preface my answer by saying uh, uh, I'm the only one on the panel who doesn't have a professor in front of that. <laughs> in fact, I'm not qualified for anything. So uh, on the, uh, I don't have, even have a postgraduate certificate in education. So uh, on the basis of that, um, I would say that technology poses school leaders with a number of challenges. Um, I think that, um, uh, I'm start by saying, if you haven't read The Shallows by Nicholas Carr, I, I read that because I started looking for a summary of it on the internet and realized that guessing from the title, if I was looking for a summary of it, summary of it on the internet, I really needed to read the whole book. Having read the whole book, I, I did really need to read the whole book. I think technology has the capacity to, com to commoditize people. And I think schools are where we need to make sure that the emerging population of our countries uh, do not commoditise people, but remember that people are individuals. And in that context, I think uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning has the capacity to hollow out the worst bits of teaching in terms of marking and assessment uh, and so on. And I, I look forward to it doing that. Not as much as those who spend more time in the classroom than me. Um, the creativity has been referred to. I think creativity is something we need to uh, work. It, it will remain an issue for uh, our young people to work out what problems to solve. And if nothing else, to prioritise research spending on where machine learning goes uh, first. Uh, do we use it, for example, for medicinal uh, properties or for uh, promoting agriculture 
uh, and agricultural success uh, in areas of the world which struggle with that. So back, to, I guess, uh, Rose's comments about ethics. Uh, and on that subject, I think I would say that we need to teach young people to disagree well, because they will never have known a time when uh, social media didn't try to place them in an echo chamber of their own views. And only external, and I suspect human <coughs> intervention, can face young people with the challenge of learning while they're at school to disagree well. And in that context, um, picking up on something that Stephen said, when to be competitive and when not to be. Uh, and in that context, very briefly, and in the context of what John has said about metacognition, um, three years ago we began, began a process at Lerkinson where we subverted the normal process of teachers writing subject reports and then senior staff writing summations of that. We just said we're not going to write summations of pupil reports ever again. The pupils are going to do all of that. So starting in year seven, our pupils write their own synthesis of reports. They write an agenda for parents' meetings. They conduct parents' meetings. They share the discussions between uh, their parents and their teachers. Because their ability to understand their own learning and start to direct it is going to be something which becomes really important. And one of the things I'm trying to do is make taking an online course a compulsory part of our sit form. So the pupils learn this thing about directing their own, being the, the stewards, the custodians, curators of their own learning process. Because the rapidity of change tells us that school will be increasingly inadequate as a preparation for a life that reaches well beyond 100th birthdays as the norm in the future. I think there's two different ways of looking at this question. There's a advice I would give to educators, and then there's the advice I'd give to people in charge of designing the education systems. Because as educators, we have to operate within the system um, that exists. And I would say that I have taught in schools and colleges as well as in universities, and I know how challenging that can be. And I would say to educators, Make sure you understand what AI is and what it isn't, as I said previously. It's really important. It's here. It's not going away. And help your staff to understand it and feel comfortable with the fact that they don't, but they need to, and help them to do that. But then I would look at it in three ways. I think there's ways in which AI technologies can be very, very useful in education. Um, we can individualise instruction of subject material very effectively using AI systems. Um, we can do a lot of the record keeping. We can do lots of useful things in education using AI. And then it's not just the AI systems themselves, it's the way that we interface with the technologies. You know, using something like voice-activated interfaces is really useful for everybody but not least for some people with special educational needs for whom you know, typing on a keyboard or, or, or on a touch screen is not an option. We can do some amazing things, and I think special educational needs is a key area where AI can be particularly helpful. Then there's how we need to change what we teach because AI is bringing automation to the workplace, and that's where this notion of looking at self-understanding and meta-intelligence is fundamentally important. And then thirdly, there's the understanding about artificial intelligence. We need to make sure everybody understands enough to keep themselves safe and to use AI for their benefit, for their students' benefit, for their families' benefit. So I look at it in three different ways. But if I was being asked to give advice to people designing education systems, there's one thing that I think we need to do more than anything else, and that is to redesign how we value what education is for. We have AI that could ace any GCSE, any A-level. Why do we do these tests and exams? It's just generating people to do the things we've now built AI systems to do. We really need to look very differently what we value. I'm not anti-assessment, please don't think, I think assessment is important, but it doesn't have to be the way it is at the moment. We need, you know, to evaluate things like resilience, things to learn, like learning from failure, being good at learning, 
we need to really look differently at how we value things. Because at the moment, you know, if I'm a parent and I have a child in school, of course they want them to get those exam certificates because that's the currency that helps them to get on in the world. And unless we change that currency, it's very hard to change any of the other parts of the system. Thank you very much to the panel for those, those answers. Um, let's open it to the floor now. We've got a rare opportunity to ask, uh, ask this panel questions. There's a, a roving mic at the back. Who would like to start? Can I just it's, um, it's sort of assumed in all other professions. It's, it's assumed in all the other professions. So, so manufacturing, uh, robots are replacing workers, and, and in law, um, that, 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 that uh, it, yeah, and accountancy, that, that it's just going to be replaced. So that's a natural assumption. With, with, what, what changes do you think is, will, you, you, do you see it affecting in teaching, and how? Who'd like to go first? Shall I ask Richard? Thank, Thank you. you. I think. Um, the, uh, Matthew Taylor's review of the, the uh, workplace of the future for the RSA is, I think, a really good place to start and answer that. I think he concluded that 70% of jobs would have a significant element removed by AI, but actually comparatively few jobs would disappear altogether. I think teaching will be like that. I think there will be exercise, things that teachers have to do now that they won't have to do uh, in the future, and the most obvious element of that, I think, is assessment. Um, I, I was reminded this morning during John, John's session that um, the danger is that sometimes a wrong answer can tell us a lot about a pupil. And I'm thinking about the pupil who I believe wrote in an RSGCSE when asked who was disappointed about the return of the prodigal son and wrote the fatted calf. <laughs> And, and actually, sometimes children write brilliantly wrong answers. And I hope that our, the algorithms we develop to do assessment and marking and things like that will identify the creative wrong student. And therefore, we will need for some time to have some kind of human oversight of that to spot um, children of that nature. And I, I, all of us who have responsibility for children can imagine or thought, uh, who those might be amongst our pupils. Um, but I think the tedious, repetitive parts of jobs will go first. But instruction, as Rose said, will, will go after that. Um, uh, Martin, my colleague, I travelled here this morning and was citing a research study that pupils prefer the lack uh, of disappointment and sarcasm and bad mood days of uh, I, uh, AI instruction over human beings. So uh, quite a lot will go eventually. But these systems will still need design. Um, and I suspect uh, educators will end up designing and curating systems rather than being them. Does anyone want to add to that? I just want to add to that question. I don't have an answer, but it just strikes me historically that we've always been about finding more efficient ways to do things. And it's taken so much of the labor, like if you had to have uh, wood for your fire, you had to cut a tree. Well, before there were actual tools to do that, it took a long time to cut down a tree and then make it into little things. Now you have chainsaws and all these things. The, the technology historically has always relieved us of a lot of the burdens of, of life, and now we have it so we can do a lot of things, a lot of other things that we didn't have to use to do for you know, just normal everyday survival. It's always been this way. So I, what I have a question is, uh, to what extent is this new? Is it something that's maybe on a, on a curve that's exponentially uh, increasing as far as uh, machines taking over aspects of our life and relieving us of any kind of work at all? Or is this just a continuation, sorry, not just, but is this a continuation of this historical trend that's been there for thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years? And so to what extent is it a new thing that we should be frightened of versus it's just, the, it's just everyday uh, uh, kind of mundane thing that's always been true of human history? I'm just thinking my neck way out here because I don't know what the answer is. Do you guys want to? Stephen, no? you want to? Yeah, just look very quickly. It's inspired very much in part by the two answers that came before, and I love the fatted calf. That's <laughs> probably going to find its way into the talk at some point. Um, if what we have is narrow, myopic, goal oriented teaching, there is no point because we don't mark fatty calf with excellent good thinking. 
which is algorithm wood, and it's like you can imagine on the exam script when you come to mark the 400th, you might not either. Um, if that's what we do, there's no point in having teachers. We might as well have algorithms. Because if you produce narrow learning, you don't need good people. You just need narrow excellence. Having said that, if we use AI as part of one of the many tools that we as a species have created over a thousand years, as you rightly say, we have the opportunity to broaden what we do as teachers and educators in our society. I think that not only broadens what people can do and what they can learn, but also provides them with information about a powerful tool which helps them set goals that appear impossible. Um, the analogy I would give would be, uh, in the late 1960s, human beings walked on the moon. That was not just to do with building rockets that didn't blow up, because we kind of knew how to do that in the 1950s. It was actually about smart computers and tools that all were pedantically put into place to produce a perfect storm of technology in order to do something superhuman. And I think if we have technology, it can augment what we believe is possible. And I would love young people in generations to come to wake up and say, I am going to solve this pollution problem. And they see AI as one of the tools that they can use, but it gives them the confidence and credibility to set that goal as high as possible. I just want to pick up on this point about is it are we just heading in the same direction as we have before? I actually think there's something qualitatively different about the situation that we now face. Because of course with machine learning algorithms that learn from masses of data, there's lots of data about us as humans, our behaviours, those algorithms learn about us. And I think, you know, we need to acknowledge the possibility that they may well start to understand us better than we understand ourselves. And that starts to move into manipulation. And, you know, we know already parts of the world where in schools and classrooms brainwashing is happening using AI. And I think that does make it fundamentally different because I think it's, it's tapping into something about what it is to be human. And I don't think that's happened before, so I do think it is different. Personally, I think the job of an educator will change profoundly. I'm, I find it really interesting, the number of reports that now come out telling us how many jobs are going to go in this sector, what's going to happen here. Actually, the truth of the matter is we don't really know. Yeah. You know. What we do know is it's going to be uncertain, and there's going to be a lot of change. And change is very stressful. The older we get, the more stressful change is. When you're young, change can seem quite exciting. As you get older, it just seems very scary. Um, but we need our students to be able to deal with that change. And actually, we're probably less able to deal with it than they are when they're younger. So there's, this, there's, something, there's something very different happening. If we want people to learn throughout their lives, as they're going to need to, and that might be 80 years of learning, it might be 90 years, then educators are going to be incredibly important. But I think it might be more about mentoring and helping people to understand what the data is telling them about themselves, about how they might learn this more effectively, and how they might be, um, if you like, efficient and effective, but also satisfied and, and fulfilled. So I think it will be very different, but I do think it will change a lot. Thank you all, uh, the panel, for that. I, I just wanted to take up on one of well, perhaps it pulls together several of the things we've heard, but a year or so ago I was asked to interview a group of um, young people in their late 20s, all of whom had been through school, through university, and were now doing very well in their careers, but in the early stages of their careers. Um, and a number of them were working in uh, well, uh, jobs that you know, we so often hear this now that didn't exist five, ten years ago. And the, the purpose of the interview was to find out what they wished they'd learned at school. Um, and I now work with governing bodies a lot, and I ask them all to do this with their alumni, to do this exercise. But these young people said to me, 
that what they most wished they'd learned at school was uh, based around soft skills, it was based around learning to cooperate, to liaise with other people, to lead and chair, um, and also, very interestingly, self-awareness. And I think that does tie in quite a lot with what you're saying, and, and that those were the things they were particularly valuing. So I think that's quite another, another quite interesting thing to take back to, to schools and maybe, maybe do as an exercise. More, any more questions? Have we got the throw and catch in the <laughs> afternoon? Thank you. Good thing um, you're not a robot. <laughs> <laughs> the next story would be perfect. <laughs> um, thank you. I mean, really just picking up on, on those last two points, really. Um, Dr. Walker spoke at great length about um, associated processing and thinking a little bit about um, what are maybe some of those metacognitive you know, biases and signposts that he uses in his work. Um, and really, I just wanted to pick up on the question that he posed at the end of his session, which was, what kind of cognition is, is machine resistant? And I think we've touched on some of those things, but you know, I, I suppose my question is, is there a, a common language associated with you know, machine resistant um, aspects of, of, of cognition? And, and, and if not, you know, is this actually you know, a rich area for, for, for development? Um, because clearly, you know, you're absolutely right, I think augmentation is, is important and actually trying to, to, to combine both um, the machine learning and maybe some of that machine resistant learning is very important to optimize obviously learning outcomes for the students. Can I ask Stephen to start on answering that one? Uh, it's a big question, I'll try and give a, a relatively small answer. Um, we simply don't know what will or will not be machine resistant. Um, best evidence to date is that nothing will be machine resistant. Algorithms, machines will do everything that we do, um, as capable as we do or, or better. Is that terrifying? Will they necessarily take over or displace us? No, not at all. I, I, they, are, they are still the tail, and the tail doesn't wag the dog. Um, we do need to get our act together, though, understanding how we want to use smart algorithms, how we want to use them to replace human drudgery. And remember, one person's drudgery is a potentially a steady income for somebody else. So I think understanding how we bring any new technology into society is going to be absolutely vital. But I personally don't see anything that is resilient about anything that we do as human beings, but I, I don't see that as a cause for fear. John? I, I guess I, I, I would say this from no, the degree in economics. I think can people see where there is a gap in the market? I don't necessarily mean the market. I think we need to train young people to be agile enough to see uh, in which direction investment in machine learning has gone and therefore what uh, abilities are left to be exploited by people. But not only where there's a gap in the market, where there's a market in the gap. Because um, we'll have to work out what skills are going to be necessary in the, the, the world of the future. We're doing things now that my grandparents wouldn't have conceived of. I mean, if, if, if a basic function of mine is, is efficacy with PowerPoint, I, I'd, I'd love to go back in time 40 years and try and explain that to my grandparents. I mean, it would be a real adventure, wouldn't it? And sadly, none of them were around even then to do it. But I, we can't conceive of of where the gaps are going to be. So agility, self-confidence, self-regulation, um, self-evaluation, uh, those are going to be critical skills, I think. And let's hope the next generation has them, because I think they'll need them. I absolutely agree that I think we need to get our act together. And I think there's a lot of ostrich behaviour going on with people pretending that, oh, it's, it's not here yet, it's not, that's all hype, that's all hype, it's not here yet. Because AI is here and things are changing. But I don't believe that AI will be able to do everything. I think there are elements of our subjective experience as humans in the world, um, the emotional 
emotional intelligence that we appreciate because we experience it. I know we can create algorithms that can interpret emotions and can respond appropriately, but that's not the same as having experienced emotions. I think things like empathy, things like love, um, things like accepting suffering and understanding when you're seeing suffering, what it feels like to suffer. I think all of those human qualities that we don't value perhaps enough will keep us set aside from the AI. But we need to value them more. I think there's too much... Um, I don't like the description of soft skills because actually it makes them sound like they're not valuable or, or and they're, they're really yeah it's humanity you know it's really important they're hard skills they're really difficult and really complex and really important you know I was really struck you said humanity I was really struck after the Grenfell Tower disaster when Theresa May didn't go and speak to the people who lost loved ones and then she did go back the following day the funders were saying where is your humanity and I think that's really interesting. And if I look at what's happening in Parliament at the moment, I think there's a distinct lack of social intelligence and emotional intelligence and collaborative problem solving. Because we haven't valued them. Yeah. All of those people have probably got amazing degrees and fantastic qualifications, but they don't have the skills that we need to solve complex problems. So yes, I think we can set ourselves apart. But if we're not careful, we won't. You know, we will be the robots of the future, the second-rate robots, and that's a worry. Oh, sorry. Any more, more questions from the floor? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm just listening to what you're saying about AI and its development opportunities, and it's all incredibly exciting, and I'm really struggling not to sit here with a kind of cloud of cynicism over my head, because I work in schools where the students are equipped with paper and a pen they've remembered it. And the distance between us saying we would like our children to be not goal orientated and the curricula and requirements of the society that I teach in are leap years apart. And what I'm more interested in, I suppose, is with AI being almost inevitably focused on profit, how do we shift that so that it's focused on our students, and our rate of change is glacial by comparison to what's happening in that world, we, we are so never barely away from tablets and slates and chalk. My dad's comparison of his childhood in the classroom, the only difference between that and mine is I give my kids the tension as opposed to the cane. And then there's, it feels like there's not a great draft of change. So what I'm hearing is the things it could do in the classroom, but you're all immensely intelligent, well-qualified people. Who are the people going to be who fill the gap between you and these students? Who bring that to the classroom in a way that isn't driven just by money for governments and money for corporations? Sorry to bring cynicism into the hope, but... John, are you willing to start on that one? <laughs> you know, we've done a really lousy job in my field to give it away. I mean, this is what we should be doing. You know, we, we have jobs that are largely paid by tax money and, and largely paid by you know, people you know, with tuition and this kind of thing. And we've got a wonderful job that in, in uh, less affluent civilizations and, and countries, they don't have these jobs. And so it's a luxury to have you know, people have jobs like I have. And as a field, we just have just done a lousy job of making the connection and giving it away about what we know and how to use it, uh, and how to use it effectively in, in real life. I, 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 I've seen that, and I try to do it myself in my own little way, but as a field, we just have done a lousy job. I, I think it's a, maybe a, a job for the academy. I mean, I, I, I think that there's maybe uh, a lot of uh, money goes in, or effort goes in at a university level to take applications that maybe would make jobs and profits and, and do new advances in technology, but less to take the knowledge we have about uh, empathy and people and working together and collaborations and all this and how to get it down to where it can be more effectively used, you know, at the level where it really matters, like in the classroom. 
And it's just, it's, it's, it's also true, unfortunately, in our, in our field, in psychology of mental health. You know, there's a lot of money for pharmaceuticals and a lot of money for pills, but very little, hardly any anymore, for actual, you know, mundane, everyday life kind of uh, things that people can do to make themselves feel better and to be more mentally healthy. And uh, we just abandoned all of that. So I'm, I'm a cynic too. I mean, I've seen it, and I just don't see the effort. There's no connective tissue between, like you say, the people down here, well, at least me, and, and uh, where it really matters. And, uh, you know, we can do our individual efforts, but we need something more, like you say. I mean, it's a wonderful a call to action, really. Uh, how do we get the connective tissue to, to, to deliver what is known to the, the ground zero, you know, where it really matters? If you ask my GCSE students right now what skills they should have, they teach English, they will not talk about analyzing Shakespeare. Without a doubt, they will talk about being able to communicate. All the things you were saying there, about being able to communicate, about being able to bring a team together, and they will question again and again why those aren't the skills we're teaching them in school. And we need to be questioning our ministers. Uh, it's a million dollar question. I mean, it does come down to what we value. If those were the things that were assessed, they would be the things that would be being taught. That's what's so frustrating. But I actually think there's another. And I don't like to be dystopian, and, and, and because I think there's huge potential to do great things if we get it right. And we are just about to stay in control, so we need to still have a chance of getting it right. But when you look at the size of the very large technology companies and the power that they wield, and you take yourself into a world where your Google Classroom or your whatever platform you're using as now your intelligent tutoring system for all of your students and that takes charge and it, it collects all the data and, and gradually we move into a scenario where actually we do lose the human touch and we do use precisely the things that we value. And the reason that I wrote the book for teachers is because I think teachers are the most important people and that their voice is not being heard. You know, we need teachers to be demanding from politicians that we do value human qualities. Because if we don't, then I'm sorry we will end up in schools with some bouncers and some AI tech, and, and well, that'll be for the poor kids anyway. Um, and then it'll only be the privilege to get a wonderful blended human interaction with some AI doing all the great things we could do. And I don't like to be just, but it does really worry me. Because at times when people are looking at the bottom line, and I'm not just having a pop at Google, the only one I mentioned, I just mean any, you know, a big tech company comes along and says, well, you don't have enough teachers, don't worry. We can help you with that. And then gradually, probably not very gradually, actually, probably far too quickly, you know, the system takes over. Because once you've paid initially, and maybe you don't have to pay very much, because after all, there's all that data being collected, and that data is incredibly valuable. So it worries me, it worries me enormously. Um, unless we make some changes quickly, then I well, do worry about the future. I think the literal answer to your, and the, the most prosaic answer to your question, who stands between uh, all these developments and our students is the Secretary of State for Education, the Minister for Schools and a bunch of senior civil servants. Uh, and I would only observe that if, if a premiership football club changed its manager as often as the Secretary of State for Education has changed, it wouldn't be in the premiership. Um, there's no continuity of strategy and thinking, it seems to me. Our political system is fractured from that point of view. Uh, and it's premised on a, a, a confrontational method of disagreement, which is antithetical to the very human skills we want to teach our, our pupils. So it's dysfunctional at two levels. Um, and without being too pessimistic, there's a third thing which I would uh, point to, which is that the, the ownership of the means of production, without wishing to sound um, too much like Karl Marx, is going to become even more profitable at the expense of the labour of the average person, which means our income distribution problems are going to get worse rather than better. So I think the other part of the answer I would give, and I, I didn't expect to stress this into this territory this afternoon, is I think it's a scandal that personal taxation is at a higher percentage than corporate taxation. And that will need to be reversed. And in that context, we will need to find a way of overcoming the lack of sovereignty of individual states, 
and I dare not mention Brexit, but, but the, the lack of ability to apply, for example, a super injunction uh, over Twitter so that as soon as you're not allowed to name someone who's done something in this country, they're just named in the States, uh, means that there is a lack of sovereignty of the state, which means that global rates of corporation tax are impossible to set, and there's a race to the bottom and so on. So I think there are plenty of reasons to feel pessimistic. But I think I would change it around and say... Um, our generation has halved the rate of extreme poverty in the world in the last 25 years. And there are a lot of good things going on. The challenge we need to set up, uh, those who can see a future with change, our young people, is here are a series of challenges that you are going to need to overcome. By the time your children are in school, what will you have done to make sure that the interface between what's been talked of by the professors and the pupils in schools is a much thinner interface and the connection much more immediate. And if that something seems like passing the buck, then I think that's exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time for one more question. Is there one more? Yes, at the back. Respond to that. It's not about skills. It's about intelligence. It's it, it's different because if we talk in terms of skills, we get into the the real debate about skills and knowledge, and it, that's not helpful. It is about fundamental, foundational intelligences that underpin both knowledge acquisition and application and skills. That's what we need to get back to, and. I have argued for an intelligence-based curriculum rather than a knowledge-based curriculum. Not because I think the knowledge-based curriculum is in and of itself wrong, but just because it's not what we need now. You know, the harsh reality is we have these machines that are better than us at most of the things that our schools educate students to do. It's not intelligent not to change. We have to change. But it doesn't mean getting rid of Shakespeare, I completely agree. But it does mean getting rid of some things. You know, in the UK, we are top of the league for memorization of any country in the world. And what you need less of for complex problem solving is memorization. It, it really is not sensible. But it's hard because we're very we cling on to what we know and what we understand. And, and you said it very eloquently, this is how we got here, um, through going through a system. But it's different now, because we have to face the reality of what we've created in our AI systems. Therefore, we have to try and look at the things that we can't automate in that same way, or are less prone to automation. And that is the things that make us human. Thank you, Rose, and um, I think that's a, ch a cheery note to end, actually, because there, there's currently things are changing fast, but there are certain things that we are still supreme at, and emotional engagement is the most basic human need, and we're brilliant at that, so let's just <laughs> let's keep emphasising that. I'm going to hand back to Simon, but not before I've thanked the panel for really, really interesting answers. Thank you very much. <laughs>
I'm not Sarah Thomas. <laughs> but Sarah is going to come and close our, uh, our day in a moment. But uh, it's been um, my task to design today and to try to compose a narrative that can hold together uh, these considerations and these uh, wide and deep complex perspectives. And I want to just take you back to um, where we started our, our journey today. I want to take you back to that idea about the human mind. And that idea of the human mind as a, a, a rational thinking engine that could be fed with knowledge and that we could solve the world's problems if we could extend, expand access to knowledge. And that optimism that was related to that. And we need to come to terms with the fact that we've achieved that. We have created an engine which has distributed knowledge, unprecedented knowledge. Think of the scale of the knowledge that Steve was talking about, to the four corners of the world. And yet we have not arrived at utopia. We have to recognise and wrestle with that problem. And there's been one theme which has been underemphasised today. We've talked uh, about uh, the kind of unique human qualities, we've talked about uh, what uh, we may be able to do um, better than machines. Uh, we've talked about uh, those values of, of, of empathy and those social skills. We've talked about the final points of humanity. But we need to acknowledge that uh, we have a capacity as a human species to be deeply biased in the way that we come to interpret and then act upon the world. And everyone in this room needs to wrestle with where that originates from. What is it about our cognitive function as a species that means that we can be presented with a set of information and yet choose not to process it and arrive at a rational conclusion? And my suggestion to you is that the unique position we find ourselves in today as well as Rose's very, very interesting point that we are surrounded by an environment that, where our, our digital trace about our human behaviour is now captured all the time. And so machines are learning about us as human beings and may come to know more about us than we know about ourselves. That's an astonishingly significant important thing for us to go away and think about. But my uh, suggestion to you is that what is unprecedented now is that we live our lives online and that we are choosing willingly to participate in an online 24-7, 365 global priming experiment where the components of our cognition which are being influenced and steered by that environment are not new but they are unprecedentedly amplified and then aggregated together, and done so for commercial reasons, with an accumulation of power and control vested in the hands of an unprecedentedly small population of corporate entities. So we are in an unprecedented commercial nexus that is crushing political boundaries, crushing nation stage, crushing democratic thinking processes, crushing societal interaction. And we need to wake up to just how serious this is, how fast this is happening, and that it won't slow down. So we do face choices as to how we participate in this world. But principally, we must understand how we are making collective decisions. Because the scale and damage of these behaviours 
is not rooted in a uniquely different cognitive process than 100 years ago. We haven't evolved any new cognitive process. What has changed is the amplification. And the amplification has changed because these are collective processes. Why? Because remember, we think in order to belong to a group. Because we have a social mind. And therefore, we are orientated towards others who also bias like us. There is a huge call. It addresses our needs for safety. Do you remember how much we heard from John about safety? The need to be fundamentally safe in the world. So this is deep, visceral, emotional needs which are being met. And of course, if I make myself safe, I often make you unsafe. Make you the threat. So that's what I think and what uh, is unique about the day that we find ourselves in. And it will be up to us collectively. And it will be up to, um, it's wonderful to have some uh, students from school here today, but it will, will be up to the generation of those who have lived their lives online to uh, work out how they want to govern that environment. Because if they don't, it will govern them. And it will govern their world. So you're going to have to wrestle with this. You're going to have to wrestle with it cognitively, what is going on, politically, commercially. And what restraints, what regulations, what limits, what controls, what supervision can be established. And how we then participate as individuals, intelligently, wisely, kindly, collaboratively, towards shared and sustainable uh, goals and shared ends. Now I think we've heard enough today to know that there is within the human mind the capacity to steer ourselves well, as well as we steer badly. What we mustn't allow is that we steer ourselves badly. Well, hello everybody. What a day. Um, I think the first thing I want to say is it has been an enormous treat to be here in Oxford. Um, what a wonderful place, what wonderful food, what wonderful company. Um, and thank you to everybody who has been a delegate here for taking part in the conversation. And thank you also um, to Claire for superbly sharing the panel um, and of course Simon and Fiona for a wonderful, wonderful day. I've just got a few things to say. You'll all be looking at the clock and waiting to get away. Um, I do have a bit of history on summing up at the end of certain events. When I was at Uppingham, very much younger than I am now, I was asked to say thank you um, to Paul Betts. Some of you may remember his daughter, uh, Leah Betts. Um, she was one of the um, very uh, sad <coughs> victims of the drug ecstasy um, and um, the Parents Act Uppingham had got um, these wonderful people, her parents, Hannah and Paul Betts, in to come and talk about it. Nobody had told me, although some people had seen their talk before, quite how emotional it was. So at the end of it, having seen pictures of Leah when she was a little girl on the overhead projector, because I am that old, I stood up in order to say thank you very much and promptly burst into tears and couldn't say a word. I promised not to burst into tears at this point um, and to hold my uh, confidence. When I was a very little girl, I was taught at a convent and the nuns used to tell us that despair is a sin. Um, and actually I think that's a really important thing to say. Um, at this particular moment. Um, there is a lot of positivity in this room. There is a lot of positivity in education. Um, and there is a lot of positivity in what we have heard today. And yes, there are challenges. Of course there are challenges. And of course there are priorities. And of course it's not going to be easy. Or else somebody else would have thought of the answer already. And it wouldn't be any fun anyway if it was easy. So, um, thank you enormously to um, Simon for your thoughts this afternoon. I found it a very moral session, if I can use that word, as a classicist. 
Um, thinking about being uniquely human is something that will keep me going through to speech day, as I suspect a few other head teachers here. Um, and um, I hold on to your hopefulness. Um, thank you too to Stephen. I found some of what you said pretty tough. Um, not least because um, I gave up maths when I was 16. Um, and I still remember Mrs. William, my wonderful maths teacher, who made sure I did get an O level, stopping me um, in the middle um, of going into the maths exam and saying, Sarah, if there is a question on probability, don't do it. <laughs> um, so I found bits of that quite difficult. Um, I did enjoy, of course, um, Doctor Who, um, the spurious correlations of margarine and divorce. We always have butter in our house too. Um, and it was lovely to hear from a man who believes in the good, the good in people, um, as well as the good in our intelligence, even artificial intelligence. I'm holding on to creativity, and I'm holding on to social intelligence. You can't have those yet. <laughs> Thank you to the panel. Um, I think you were fantastically well placed to help us and talk to us about AI um, and how it interfaces with education. Rose, thank you so much for meta-intelligence, but most of all, talking about the value of education and the value of people. Um, John, always positive. I love the Carol Dweck stuff. Thank you. And I enjoyed so much this morning, Dante and the Grumpy Cats. Thank you so much. I've never heard those both used in the same speech before. Um, and Stephen, talking about curiosity, so important. And Richard, um, empowering our pupils. Um, brilliantly wrong answers. Let's make sure, please, that we let them have those brilliantly wrong answers. I'm a classicist, so Socrates matters to me. Um, he was perhaps the best primer ever. Um, if any of you have ever had to translate any of his dialogues, you will know that you want to pick up a very large piece of marble <laughs> and hit him on the head with it um, when he comes back with postcard. Ooh, um, why not? Um, he was, you know, from forever we have had these challenges. From forever we have been primed. From forever also we've been talking about know thyself. It goes back, it goes back, it goes back. And of course this is different because we are dealing with a different, different technological platform that affects our humanity. I agree that. But, as a wise woman once told me, knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. So, as we go back to our schools, can we as head teachers please remember our vocation? It isn't a job, it isn't even a role, we're not play acting for God's sake. It is a vocation, and we know we make a difference. That's why we get out of bed every morning and put stupid suits on, because we know we make a difference in our schools. It's about support, it's about love, it's about energising the pupils in our care for the future, because they are individuals, and it's allowing them to be curious. And just in case that sounds like too much, remember, perfection is the enemy of good. And there is that thing we heard today, good enough. Thank you to everybody, especially to Simon Fiona. Thank you.